Jamie Tai. Uh, let's welcome to Jamie Tai. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I hope I make the 30th anniversary. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, topics that I've been uh, uh, working on for a while. And uh, in fact, uh, many people have worked on this uh, topic, uh, so I am not going to be able to give uh, all the references. Uh, so, my work, uh, latest work is mostly with. Uh, here we turn off that uh, come down. So. Okay, so uh, super string theory has been extensively studied in the last uh, uh, decade. So extensively, you know, measured by number of papers, out of uh, about 10,000 or more. Uh, but how do we know it is the theory uh, that describes uh, nature. We assume that's the case. Uh, we have some reason to believe so because we have a consistent form of gravity. But uh, uh, it would be nice to know if there's some way to test uh, this basic assumption that we have, uh, considering the fact that uh, the community there put so much effort into it. Now, from my point of view, the best way to test this no question is to detect the super strings, okay, to find it. However, all particles are made of uh, super strings, but they are modes of string theory, and they're very, very tiny. So tiny that there's no chance uh, we can uh, observe the stringy features in a lab. Uh, not by collider or anything comparable. However, uh, it is entirely possible, and I would like to argue likely, that these super strings uh, can appear for particles, or all electron, or photon are tiny little strings, but there can also be large strings, strings that stretch stretch across the sky. Uh, they, of course, will be produced in the early universe, and detecting them will, of course, be revolutionary. And that essentially is very much like the other things that the whole universe becomes the uh, uh, provide us a detector. Things that tiny will be stretched across uh, horizon, and uh, detection is uh, possible by cosmological observations. Now, I should point out that the cosmic strings have been proposed about 40 years ago about by Tom Kibble, and over a long period of time, it extensively studied. Uh, people propose it as a source for density perturbation that uh, provide uh, structural formation because a string moves, uh, that will provide uh, density perturbation. However, uh, the cosmic microwave background measurement uh, with acoustic peaks blew that out because uh, uh, these production of density perturbation are active and there's no acoustic peaks. And so that whole field sort of uh, uh, died uh, by year 2000. Now, Cosmic superstring come along uh, in a way which has avoided the uh, observational uh, predictions by cosmic strings, and yet I think that uh, uh, we still have a very good chance to measure that. So I'll go over the overall picture. And I should point out that the cosmic strings from original proposal by Tom Kibbles and others are quite different. Uh, than the uh, cosmic superstrings, that means strings coming from string theory. Okay. There are a lot of similarities, uh, but uh, the differences are very important in order for us to uh, realize uh, what these strings are really are, if ever discovered. So, the first thing is of uh, string theory. I'll give you a very basic, uh, just pictorial rundown of string theory. Uh, it's uh, all elementary particles are made up of tiny. Uh, modes of uh, string theory. So here a picture drawn is that uh, they are closed strings, but some of them, many of them are open strings in the modern picture. And as you hear uh, Professor Yao talk about, uh, there's uh, nine spatial dimensions for string theory, and six of them have to be compactified, and uh, compactification ordered to very small sizes, and typically is done in a Calabi-Yao manifold, 
or something very similar to Calabiyao. And uh, that has been studied extensively. So, and if we have strings in the theory, then the strings actually is different from potential, they are original cosmic strings in the sense that uh, they can form uh, junctions, as the picture shown, and uh, at the end of junctions, they can form beads, and if you do it to a gauge theory, this is like a baryon, and they have a mass, so the picture is uh, somewhat uh, different from the simple uh, abelian fixed vortices, for example. And this string theory, if you do to gauge theory, it's a strongly impacting gauge theory. On the other hand, uh, these strings, suppose I have two strings, and then strings will pass each other, and when they pass each other, this intercomputation, they can recombine, as in the picture shown here, and uh, depends different kinds of strings, they will recombine in different ways. And for traditional cosmic strings, uh, the probability of recombining is uh, one, but for super strings, uh, recombined probability depends on the relatively speed, relative angle, and can be as small as uh, 10 to the minus 3. So that's a huge difference in terms of the properties later that I will discuss. Okay, so the picture now we have in string theory mostly is the framework picture. That is, our three dimensional space uh, lived in a frame, three dimensional frame, which is dimensional space. And here I draw a picture with the two dimensions there where all the galaxies are stars are in. And this is called brain. And the brain is inside the nine dimensional space we have. Okay. So on the right hand side I draw a picture which is like uh, you think about color the out. So I draw here is that this is like a Calabria manifold, and uh, the, our understanding now dynamically uh, there's something called floats. Okay, floats are nothing but warp geometry. If you are uh, uh, particle theorist, you know this is like the six-dimensional version of random central warp geometry. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, the blue dots and the red dots are really three-dimensional frames. So that means a dot is really three-dimensional uh, space. And these three-dimensional spaces we're living, which is a size of uh, cosmological sizes, while these six dimension they live in, which is like a point, uh, are very small. Okay. So this is the picture that we have today. And if you have cosmic strings, they will live uh, a border of flows typically because the one geometry makes them light, and, uh, and it just very difficult to live in the bottom of the throat. And so is the brains, okay? Brains is the three brains, which is, so our universe may be one of this sitting in one of the throat. Okay. So we may be a stack of three brains uh, sitting at the bottom of the throat. So this is the picture that, uh, at the moment, is the most uh, prevailing picture that we have uh, within string theory. And we can actually study dynamically how this happens. So it's how the compactification happens, how this geometry come out. Now you can ask, how many throats are there? That really depends on the manifold we talk about. It can be a dozen throats, in some cases it can be a hundred throats, and each can be one in a different level. Okay? So for example, uh, if the scale here is gut scale, then you want it can be X scale, X bar scale. So this is one way to understand X bar. For example, so this is the overall picture we have, and we want to now look at uh, how cosmic string can be produced. Okay. One way to produce is uh, by the brain equation, where you have some brains here, uh, anti-brains here, and then a brain is falling in. So suppose uh, our, uh, we have, uh, say, I here draw four brains here, four anti-brains here, and one brain, and then the brain temperature have attractive force between them. Okay. And the attractive force between them will bring them kind of closer together. And when they annihilate, that's the end of inflation. But before they annihilate, uh, the brain tension provides the vacuum energy that drives inflation. Okay. So the picture is very, very simple. And here I'm drawing the brain and that brain. At the moment, they are colliding and they are annihilating each other. So when they annihilate, energy is released, and 
the energy will go to particles, but the energy will go to closed strings, and some of them can be size of the universe, okay, horizon size. That's essentially what happened to the picture. Okay. So, in this very simple case, uh, we can actually uh, write out a simple model, the simplest possible model. It's a uh, pre inflation from uh, uh, number of people modified. And you find that in this case, there's only one parameter, which is uh, this parameter, okay? which phi is the diffeton. And the one is because the brain tension, we have brain and high brain, the two tension together. And the one over phi four is nothing but the gravitational force between two point particles in six dimensions. So there are three brains, but in a Calabriau, they appear in a six dimension, they appear point and gravitational force in six dimension is uh, one of our four. And uh, in the, uh, what we know is one of uh, our, the gravitational force, because that's in three dimensions, so the six dimension is our four. So in a sense, there's a very generic and robust prediction. And in this case, uh, as the brain and time brain get close together, <coughs> Uh, this is not a potential usually used for inflation because as phi goes to zero, this seems to be going negative. But what really happening is that when they get close enough, uh, then the uh, extra few appears and uh, uh, annihilation happen uh, before uh, this turn negative. Okay. So, so it's a very robust within string theory, but not in terms of usual uh, uh, activities. So, and uh, they, brain, anti-brain uh, also have attractive force from the brain charge together with the gravity, and that's why they go towards each other. So if you know about two brains, then they have uh, uh, attractive gravitational but repulsive brain charge, and they cancel each other, and that's why uh, brains usually can be, yes, they can uh, live with each other, but uh, brain, anti-brain always uh, approach each other and collide and die. So, in this case, uh, once you set the power spectrum, cosmic background, uh, background uh, temperature fluctuation, power spectrum size, uh, magnitude, uh, then the, the NS that uh, Sal talked about is completely detected, and that's essentially a uh, number which is in good agreement with the experiment. And, but the R, unfortunately, is uh, 10 to minus 9, which means that uh, the B mode in this model, or uh, a model of this class uh, would uh, unfortunately never be observed. If, if you can make tensor mass, you can have <laughs> 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 I don't know how to do that strict theory. So. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I stick to strict theory, so. Well, wow. yeah. you should think about how to do it in strict theory. <laughs> well, I, I will worry only when they see it. Okay. In strict, so, so in this particular model, uh, you also find the string tension, uh, which is uh, g mu. So this is very important. Let me point out that uh, mu is the cosmic string tension. Okay? And we usually always multiply by Newton's constant. So g mu is a dimensionless number. And this number is uh, crucial for cosmic strings and cosmic superstrings. And uh, in this case, the tension is about 10 to the minus 10. Okay? Now, the present bound uh, for Tom's book, Thomas timing, which uh, in a paper coming out, will be may reach 10 to the minus 11, but this is only for fundamental uh, original cosmic strings, not for super strings. For super strings, because they have beads and junctions, actually the bound will be relaxed. So this is totally consistent with uh, Thomas timing bound. Okay. Now, uh, maybe it's a good time that I should point out uh, one thing is that the original proposal of cosmic strings to produce the density fluctuations to explain structure formation required GMU to be 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6 had certainly be ruled out, and 10 to the minus 7 ruled out, and how's the timing ruled out 10 to the minus 8. So, so the bound is getting tighter and tighter, and so cosmic string production of B-modes also would be uh, much, much smaller than uh, any possibility that have been observed. Uh, the important thing now is that I want to point out is that I give you a particular scenario of uh, uh, inflation, how in string theory, cosmic string can be produced. And people have classical estimate that. 
But there's other scenarios uh, in string theory for inflation. And in those cases, uh, we have not estimated uh, how much cosmic string we produce. Cosmic string, I mean, classical sizes of strings instead of uh, uh, point-like uh, strings. Okay. But turn out that to the best we can tell is that that's not an important question. So suppose strings are produced, some amount of strings. Let me say initially, uh, this is the standard form of the media, vacuum energy. Uh, strings, because they are one-dimensional, they go like one of A squared. Like beta equals AQ, three dash for A4. But if they go one of A squared, even if you produce a little bit, over time, as the universe expands, they will become more and more important. And then at a certain point, they become important enough uh, that uh, uh, their behavior will be dominated not only by uh, the strings not interacting with each other, but the, the interaction, the intercommutation property, chop off uh, string loops, and then they will decay by gravitational radiation, which is the point I will come back to. Okay. And so it's interesting that, amazingly, the cosmic string network will essentially approach a scaling network solutions independent of detail how you produce it, how much you produce it. So this is the key. And then the best estimate is that the contribution to the uh, density omega equals one is for our universe today, but mostly dark energy, dark matter, and audio matter. But cosmic string will produce something which is like 50 times time GU. But GU is smaller than 10 8. So the contribution to the any content of the universe from strings is totally negligible. So that's the important point that I would like to point out. Now, uh, when I talk about uh, string form junctions, the reason is because in string theory, there's two kinds of uh, strings. One is, of course, the strings we talk about, fundamental strings. But we are talking about brains, right? We, talk, we live in a D3 brain. But there's also D1 brains here. And D1 brains are nothing but strings. So there's two kinds of strings, F strings and D strings. Now, the important thing is, automatically in this theory, there's no D0, no D2. Okay. D0 brain will be like a monopole. Okay. But this theory has no such objects. And D2 would be like membranes, and this theory has no such objects. And we know that the monopoles or membranes can be a big problem. Uh, we can overclose the universe. But automatically, in this string framework, they don't exist in the uh, okay. So the only thing that exists is an odd number of uh, brains, D1, D3, for example. So it's uh, uh, bound on the uh, other topological defects are uh, essentially uh, not applicable here. So. Now, because of, the, of this property, uh, because of this property, uh, even you produce a little bit, uh, it will approach the scaling. So here I indicate the following. Uh, I give uh, three scenarios. Uh, one is solid line, one is dash, one is dot. Uh, how much they produce initially? Okay. So this is total strings uh, produced initially. And this is the one particular component, F, uh, here actually for these strings, A, as that much. Okay. So we take the solid line. If you produce, this is time, uh, actually, uh, oh, this, uh, this is cosmic scale factor, A, okay? So if you start a cosmic scale factor equals to one, if you the solid line say produce a lot, uh, and particular D1 string produce uh, some, and then you see the evolution will be approach uh, scaling solution after A goes through about uh, a, a thousand E volts, okay? Uh, now if you can produce very little, doesn't matter. You can see that it doesn't matter how much you produce initially, uh, they will all go to a scaling solution. And that, in that sense, uh, uh, how they are produced uh, is not as important as the fact they are produced or not. Okay, so we only care about if they are produced or not. And generically, even in other scenarios, inflation string theory, we haven't worked it out, but uh, it's reasonable to expect that they will also produce some and eventually approach a scaling solution. So, now, here's a few points I want to make. Uh, that earlier I mentioned there's a number of throws. I turn out that each throw can have its own strings, cosmic super strings. And we have its own tension with their own junctions and with its own scaling evolving uh, to a network. 
So if you have uh, a dozen frauds, then you have a dozen networks, and they act together, and they will have different tensions. So generically, we expect that the tension will come with a number of uh, different values, not just a single value, okay? That's uh, one important feature, and then we increase the number of strings around, okay? And the second is that uh, the intercommutation probability is uh, much smaller generically than cosmic strings, and then we'll enhance the density, and then we'll enhance the uh, detectability uh, that we want to go ahead. So, so here we estimate, uh, give a crude estimate, and how these enhance compare with usual cosmic strings. Okay. Now, another very important point. Originally, people talk about tensions for 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. And people have studied the gravitational wave coming from them. And the gravitational wave coming essentially, if I string that's evolving uh, a loop, they would decay. And they decay by emission, emitting gravitational waves, so gravitational radiation. The particular time, uh, type of gravitational radiation we're interested in is not that they all decay, emit gravitational radiation, and then there's stochastic gravitational waves uh, in the universe and may be detectable. It may not be so easy. We are interested in a particular type is that uh, when they evolve, a string loop will evolve, and then if you have a kink there, the kink will go around, and then that will emit gravitational radiation. Okay. A little bit like Bram Stroller. And the other type is that as a string evolves, every now and then they will form a cusp. Okay. And the tip of the cusp will move speed light, and if we sweep through, uh, then you will see gravitational wave uh, uh, a burst towards us. Okay. So, so we are interested in not the stochastic gravitational wave uh, uh, background due to uh, all the gravitational radiation coming from cosmic strain is you know, over the evolution of the universe, but rather the bursts because that's a much cleaner. Okay? So we're looking for those. Now, uh, earlier people have estimated, many people work on this, their estimate is that uh, it's not observable okay? because the tension is low, that these gravitational bursts are weak, and that uh, it's not observable. So what we want to say is that uh, uh, there's another feature we should say, is that if the tension is low, then the gravitational radiation will be weak, and so the loops will live long. At the same time that uh, if they live long, and if the gravitational radiation is weak, uh, uh, they will not uh, move around as much. So earlier, something called rocket effect is that if I have gravitational uh, burst of a string, uh, then the recoil will, will boost it. So this is called rocket effect, and they will move around, and then they will not be uh, non retroactive So this is our uh, original picture. But now the tension is low. We talk about tension maybe 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 12, and then gravitational radiation very weak, the string loop is very long, and they don't get the recoil much, so they will actually behave like dark matter. And the clumping of dark matter will cause the cosmic superstring density to increase. And this is the clustering that will enhance by maybe as much as five order magnitude compared with the uh, density that people work on. And this will happen within the halo of a Milky Way, for example, or uh, in the uh, nearby galaxies. And this enhancement is what makes observation possible. So in a sense that if the tension is lower than 10 to the minus 6, it's get harder to track, and 10 to the minus 8 is very hard. But then, around 10 to the minus 10, uh, this custody effect happened, and then they become detectable again, okay, in the nearby uh, region, if, especially within our own uh, galaxy, uh, our Milky Way. Human. So there's two ways to detect it. One is well known is that uh, uh, a cosmic string, which is perpendicular to this, will introduce a deficit angle. Uh, it's a flat space, but the deficit angle. So uh, it will be like a cone. So if you have uh, one star, it may appear double image with a string uh, pointing out. And then we may see a, a star become a double star. Okay. So this is the uh, behavior. So this is the picture. Uh, as a cosmic string in between, uh, move around, 
and then the, as you move away, uh, the, one, uh, the double image becomes single, and move further, you go back to a star. So when a cosmic string moves in front of a star, you can see double. However, we're now able to resolve the two stars, but what we see is that the, the luminosity incrementally will result in double uh, in the period of time. And then we go single. So the string will oscillate, and then you uh, produce uh, uh, this behavior. So this is the luminosity of single star, and then you will go double and single, double and single. And uh, if the string uh, vibrates in front of a star, and then the string moves along, then the rest of the part of the string loop will produce uh, some more. So this is the generic picture. Uh, very, very clear. It, uh, this is the luminosity change is not like a few percent, but double the, sort of the digital change. And this is, uh, and since we cannot resolve the star, this we call microlensing. Okay. And microlensing is one way to detect it. Uh, so I talked about these two key points. And uh, uh, the estimate now, because of the enhancement of the density within our galaxies, or any galaxy, because of the clustering, uh, then there's a chance to be detected. So maybe uh, eventually the w, uh, w, uh, w first or uh, like the LSST may have a chance to detect it because they're going to look at the stars. Many of them uh, uh, over a short period of time repeat again and again. Uh, there's actually an uh, interesting uh, survey study uh, by Subaru Telescope looking at Andromeda, and uh, uh, we don't know that data will be good enough to uh, uh, observe, detect, and put it back. Okay, so, but uh, uh, in that case, it's a look at the whole Andromeda. Uh, they look at 90 seconds and off 90 seconds and on for uh, 190 times. And the data stay already. Mm -hmm. so. But now I go to gravitational uh, wave first. So what happened to gravitational curves is that, the, as I mentioned, there's cusp and pink, okay? And they will give first. So the behavior of a cusp uh, is both like a, a t to the one third. So that means that as you sweep through us, we see a gravitational wave coming in and then go to zero because when the cusp is uh, pointing exactly towards us, sweep through, and then you see it again. So the signal will be a little bit like this. Uh, how does this thing? Uh, when uh, cusps pass through. Uh, pink will be t to the two-thirds. Uh, so, so it's a very distinct wave form when it uh, hit us. So I'll, I'll estimate putting in the clustering, the cosmic string, uh, 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 stringy properties in, uh, we estimate that uh, for cut for LIGO, uh, maybe in this range uh, you can uh, have a chance to see it. So this plot I should explain a little bit. This is the uh, log plot of the rate per year per signal to noise. Okay. So this is signal to noise. Uh, so this signal to noise is uh, actually we do it in a way which is the, uh, we start out here, it's a four times, signal to noise four times, and then increases. Okay. So anything in this quadrant means that there's a chance to be observed. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so this will be like 10 events per year, uh, 100 events per year. Uh, but so, so the, uh, this will be a different uh, uh, cases for a different uh, situation. Uh, this is, if you don't include the clustering or the string effect, will be not observable. But once you include this effect, there's a good chance to be seen. Okay. So that's our belief that there's a good chance that can be seen. Uh, we integrate over a year period of time. Now, we can also go to uh, Lisa Taiji. Uh, uh, I don't know the numbers for uh, Taiji, but uh, uh, the numbers for Lisa are known. And then you can see that the chances of detecting them is much bigger, much better. Okay. So the chances of detecting any of this range from 10 to minus 8 down to 10 to minus 16, uh, I think, have a very good chance to be uh, detected. Uh, if that's not seen, then uh, uh, that will put a very strong bound on what happened. And uh, also will put a strong bound on inflationary scenario within strength theory. But if they're seen, then we hope that they can also study it further about the junction property, uh, about uh, different tensions. They should see uh, cosmic strength with different tensions. 
uh, any vacancy junctions, uh, then uh, that will be a solid uh, evidence for cosmic surfacement. So, and of course, they should combine with the micro lensing uh, search, the two, you know. Uh, uh, if it uh, see micro lensing in some direction, then the gravitational wave bursts would uh, come from the same direction uh, over a period of time. So. Okay, so uh, this is for King. King is not as a good signature, but uh, still, for uh, Lisa and Taiji, I think that. Uh, uh, the very good chance they will see um, multiple events. But the waveform of Kings is not as distinct as uh, cusp, so that's why we emphasize cusp more. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, summarize uh, what we had to say. That cosmic string network has been extensive study, and uh, uh, so I won't really go to cite any paper because uh, uh, probably before year 2000, that's probably a thousand papers on this. Uh, many, many aspects in the uh, detailed study. And more recently, uh, cosmic superstring have uh, been extensively studied. But by extensively means that uh, many work have been done. But clearly, there's a lot of features have not been uh, analyzed in that detail, mostly because the difficulty of studying uh, superstrings in string theory. Uh, calculation is not trivial. Uh, now, the best way to see them, I believe, is that microlensing and gravitational waves, uh, wave burns, uh, to detect them, and they should be combined, hopefully. Uh, and uh, if they ever discover, I think that uh, will be uh, I think the best possible evidence of uh, directly showing that string theory is uh, relevant to. But if uh, some of the brains uh, wrap the uh, uh, compact dimension so that you have different strings than uh, P, uh, D, or F string? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, spin, the, the tension spectrum of strings is uh, rather non trivial to calculate. Uh, the only thing that we have calculated in the downward throw is uh, you, you have to take a throw which is uh, semi-realistic. And the only throw that uh, down there people calculate the spectrum, or we and other people calculate it, is the Kalabi's, uh, uh, is the faster throw. Now there's other throws you can calculate, but uh, at the moment nobody has gone through the calculation. But generically, uh, we believe that there will be junctions and beads, or which are baryons, uh, of different types. Uh, so this is generic picture they have. I don't think there will be only a simple strength by itself. I think that's can be, maybe, but uh, this would be a special case. So, but so clearly we should. Uh, I think the other geometry, uh, in, in principle, calculations uh, doable. But just uh, other geometry. Okay. Let's thank Professor Tai again. So this concludes our session in the morning, and there's lunch outside. Okay, yeah, it was not the uh, okay. Okay. Will you join the uh, talk? Yeah. Yeah.